All right, uh, good evening. This is Wednesday Night Bible Study. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Luke, chapter number 18, please. Luke, chapter number 18. Uh, we're going to pick up on the topic of repentance and uh, the definitional uh, aspects of it, and that it does not mean, um, or I should say, that repentance in the, na in the nature of to turn from sin is not required uh, for salvation. Never once in your scripture do you ever see the, the word repentance and then turn from sin and repentance and, you know, whatever it is to, to, to for salvation or for eternal life or for justification. But it's an often used topic or, or word. If you read a chick track, anybody ever seen a chick track? The little tra tracks that have been around for years, years and years, decades, really. And in those tracks, uh, Jack Chick writes the little thing at the end. He says, you know, you need to confess your sins, repent of your sins, right? Turn from your sins and then turn to Christ, right? So they say that all the time, and they, they say you need to repent of your sins, or in other words, turn from your sin. Well, I'm going to go through today how that's not possible, how that, that whole concept and philosophy is just, it's just absolutely ridiculous, and that what it really is, is, a, is what Luke 18 is. When you tell somebody, and, and some, just to get the, the lay, lay on the land here, when you tell somebody to turn from sin, number one, how do you know what sin is? Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verse number 7, I had not known sin, but by the law. Right? I had not known lust, except the law told me that that's not right. You follow me? So there is, of course, your moral ingrained nature that you have, and then there's the, 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 the nurtured aspect that you learn from your, your youth and from you know, training up a child and those type of things. But then there's also the law, which, which dictates and lays out what sin is. So if somebody tells you you have to turn from sin, what must you know? We have to know what the law is. You have to know what sin is. And what is the opposite of sin? If I were to say to you, give me the opposite of sin, what would you say? Uh, good stuff, right? Well, 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 righteousness, right? So what is righteous? Well, nothing that man intrinsically has. What is righteous then? Righteousness comes only from God. So what is God's declaration and example for righteousness? The law and Jesus Christ. Two things, the law and Jesus Christ. They look at the law and you say, Law is perfect, it's holy, it's just, it's good, right? But what does it do in all of that? <laughs> it demonstrates to you your sinful nature. So when somebody tells you, I'm going to tell you flat out the very beginning of this, when somebody tells you to repent of your sin and turn from your sin for eternal life, they are telling you to do good works and to keep the law. See, they can't say to keep the law, right? Why? Because that's too obvious, right? We can't tell people to keep the law. That's ridiculous. If we tell people to keep the law, they're going to find verses that say what? Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin, right? And all of a sudden, you're going to go, yeah, for the law is knowledge of sin. And you're going to realize that the more you study the law and the more you try to turn from your sin, the more you're going to realize you're not saved. You follow me? People that struggle with their eternal security are probably brought up in the concept that they need to turn from their sin in order to get saved. See, when you understand the perfect, finished, complete work of cross, Christ on the cross, you don't question your justification. There, there's really, there's, what's the question here? The, the, the issue is, well, we'll say, well, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Well, we can talk about that verse. It doesn't mean that you lose your salvation. It, it does mean that you should understand how close you were to dying and spending eternity in hell. Right, but the justification nature is free, and it happens uh, as as a gift of God, not of works, and that God justifies the who the ungodly. So when you look in Luke chapter eighteen, I'm going to tell you today that people who tell you to turn from their sin have a fundamental misunderstanding about the concept of repentance. Repentance has a multitude of definitions. None, even if one of the definitions, let's just we're just going to assume, just for the sake of the argument, let's say one of the definitions is to turn from sin, it's never used in that context for salvation. Look with me at Luke chapter 18 and verse number 9. It reads this, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And notice this next phrase, and despised others. See, this is the way it works. When you don't think you're on equal playing ground with people, you start to think of yourself as being better. And when you tell somebody to turn from their sin, what do you get to do? You get to hold something above their head. Well, oh, you're not you're not doing that stuff you're not supposed to do. Well, look, all of us should be should be helping and 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 and, and encouraging other believers to not commit sin, right? Of course. That's that's part of Christian living. Uh, but at the same point, we're not doing that for justification, right? We're doing it why? Why do you not, why do you not sin? Why? Why do you why do you not sin? Well, it's contrary to God. 
right? It, it's, it's just, it's, you obviously know it's not pleasing to God to sin. You know, that's not, it's not acceptable, right? So look at this verse here and read it again. And he spake this parable in a certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Inherently, does any man possess righteousness? Okay, there's none righteous. No, not one. There is none that doeth good. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, we have concluded once before that they are all under sin. Very easy. Very, and, it, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out, right? Just look around. Look at people's lives and go, yeah, no, no, nobody's righteous. Nobody is like God. You read this verse and he says that they were righteous. And I like this last part and despised others because typically the people who are the most zealous for righteousness usually do it for the wrong reasons. They usually do it for the reasons to make you think that they're better than you are, right? It's just a facade. They're trying to make you go, well, look at that guy. Wow, look what he's done. And then they think to themselves, ugh, look how gross that guy is. Can you believe the sins that they've committed? Can you believe the travesties in their life? Wow. And then you read this passage and you see this is exactly what he's saying. Look at verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, so by nature the individual who is extremely religious, the one who is extremely uh, uh allegedly close to God, the one who, if you were to say outwardly who is righteous, be that guy, right? Well, he, he puts on the act. He can make it look like he's doing the right things. And the other, a publican, right? Publicans are guys who take in the money, right? The tax collector kind of guys. Yeah, the publicans, nobody really likes those guys. Everybody knows they lie, cheat, and steal. It's kind of like the lawyers, right? And the, well, you know, there's so many jokes about lawyers I could go for hours on them, you know? Uh, but the, the Pharisee stood and prayed like this, thus with himself, God, I thank thee. Now notice this. There's no introspection here. There's no evaluation of himself. It's simply an external view of his righteousness. He says, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers. And then he looks down and says, or even as this publican. And then he goes on to state, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that possess. Do you think that? Do you think that God goes, "Wow, cool, great, good job"? But see, this verse right here is a demonstration of what most people think when they think they're going to turn from their sin. Let's really have a discussion about sin, real quick. Let's have a discussion about sin. See, people who who, who don't really understand sin have never studied the law of Moses. The more you study the law of Moses, the more you realize, is there something I need to look at? The more you study, uh, the, 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 more, the more you study the law of Moses, the more you realize what? What do you see? The sinful nature of yourselves. You look at it and you go, wow, man, this is impossible. Great. Perfect. That's the position that you need to be in. See, when people say, I'm going to turn from sin, let's, let's get down to the brass tacks. What sins are you going to turn from, right? Well, you don't even know all the sins yet until you study the law of Moses. Start studying the law of Moses and look at all the sins you commit. Remember, remember that, that Christ did not come to do what? To destroy the law. The law never changes at all as a declaration and demonstration of God's righteousness, does it? It doesn't. Does, do you not realize that when the Bible says where sin did abound, grace did much more abound for a reason? Because when you start to apply the law of Moses to the Gentiles who have not the law, what happens? Romans 3.19. Every mouth is stopped. The whole world becomes guilty before God. So when you sit there and you tell God you're going to turn from your sin, what you're basically doing is making a promise to God. You're making a, a contract. You're saying, God, I promise to keep the law. That's really what you're saying. You understand how I'm getting to that conclusion. Because when you say, I'm going to turn from sin, what is it? how do you know what sin is? Well, had I not, I had not known sin until the law told me, right? The law told me what sin was. So you're going to tell somebody that they got to go back and keep the law. Now, in, in all of Israel's history, how did that work out for them? Truthfully, never worked out. It never worked out where they kept the law and received the blessings of God. It's not possible. Why? Because you're a son of Adam. And you're always going to have that problem with sin. So when you ask the person, well, 
you know, one of my favorites is I got guys who are, are on Facebook and on the internet, and they, they post things all the time. Hey, man, you got to turn from your sin. You guys need to turn from your sin, blah, blah, blah. And they like to talk about it because the way they brag is to say, tell everybody that they turn from that supposed sin, whatever it was that they're, they're like to brag about. All you guys drinking alcohol, you shouldn't be drinking alcohol. You need to turn from your sin, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. You need to evaluate your life and whether or not you're even saved. And all these guys, they, they do that all the time. Well, uh, it, it's no wonder it causes people uh, heartache and it causes people to doubt their salvation because if you're tying your salvation to the, whether or not you're sinning, y- y- you're in trouble, <laughs> especially when you go back and study the law. If anybody tells me they don't sin a lot, I need to tell them to go back to the law of Moses, right? Well, John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, right? See, it's not just a little bit of sin. They like to say, well, you can't, you can't sin a little bit. It's not a willful sin. Dude, dude that, where, where, where are you getting all that stuff from, okay? Does God look down and go, okay, yeah, that's the willful one. That's the one you kind of messed up on. No, the wages of sin, singular, is death, right? So, you know, friends of mine who post these things on you know, Facebook or whatever, they, they'll state, you know, they, you need to turn from your sin and be saved or whatnot. So, you know, and then I see them the next day post, a, you know, man, did you guys see the latest Game of Thrones? And I think to myself, well, I could be like these guys and go, well, I mean, probably watching Game of Thrones is sinful. I mean, there's a lot of bad stuff in that show, right? Just throwing that out there, right? So did you turn from that sin? Or like their favorite book is the whatever. They'll, they'll post something and I'm like, oh, I know what that book is. That book is not, definitely not G-rated, you know? That's your favorite book? Right, so, so you see how, how we can take this to the extreme. See, but to them, it's not about really stopping sin. It's about the appearance of what? Of stopping sin. It's about the appearance of self-righteousness. It's just like this verse. They trust in themselves that they are righteous because they, they turn from their sin. Well, I turn from my sin. Did you turn from your sin? Well, who cares if you turn from your sin? What, what, what do you mean? If the old example was that they've always said, you know, when you talk about turning from something is if you, if you say, okay, I'm a milk bottle, right? And the milk bottle is going to turn from the bottle, right? The milk in the bottle is going to turn from the bottle. But what point in time does it ever stop touching the bottle? It doesn't because your flesh is always sin. When Paul says, I know that in me, that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, that never changes for him, okay? That's a constant everyday struggle of his life, Okay. So what's the realization for him? What does he do? Okay, I reckon myself dead indeed into sin. That's a daily thing. And I die daily is another another way he says it. So when this verse comes up, and and, and I think to myself, these guys are just comparing themselves among themselves. They're just thinking that they're going to make a contract with God. And at the end, God's going to go, wow, man, good job for turning from your sin. Well, where does this thought process come from? Where do they get these ideas that you have to turn from your sin? Well, because they read the law and they don't get it. What does the law require of you? The law requires of you perfectness. Unless you are perfect, right? You shall no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall no case enter the kingdom of heaven. All of these things. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Why? Well, that's the contract you made. That's the covenant you made with God when you when Israel said, I'm going to keep the law. So if you're going to tell God that you're going to turn from your sin, the, the way you can just spin that is to tell somebody, here's the law of Moses. Enjoy your condemnation because that's what's coming. That's it. See, reading this rest of this passage, you see the second guy who does this. Notice this in verse number 13. And the publican, standing afar off, says, Dear God, I promise, I promise, 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 I repent from my sin. I will turn from it. I'll never do it again. I promise this time I really mean it, God. This time I mean it. I'm going to turn from them. And I'll never forget, I went to the Wilds of the Rockies, a big camp up in, up in uh, Colorado. And in that Wilds of the Rockies, we had all kinds of, I went to that one. I went to Northland Baptist Bible College, uh, their camp, Northland's camp. I went to, uh, um, man, I went to a bunch of these different camps. Uh, uh, Cedar Rapids, those, all these, ki- these, these camps. And when they had these camps, they had these guest pastors that would come in and they would scare the kids into getting resaved. Because they would be like, how many of you guys are sleeping around? And I'm like, oh, that person, that guy, that guy, that guy. How many of you guys are smoking pot? That guy, that guy, that guy. How many of you guys? Are... Well, yeah, they're all sinning, okay? They don't need to get re-justified, right? They need to be edified and understand sanctification. That's what they need to understand. They don't need to be re-justified. Telling them to get re-justified doesn't help. That's not the problem. God justifies the ungodly, 
okay? He doesn't justify people who promise to be good. So what I saw in those is I saw friends of mine who'd be like, man, I got saved. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What? 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 And they'd tell me, man, I finally got saved this time. I gave my life to Jesus. That's another way they say it. Well, your life has no value. <laughs> you follow me? God's, God's not impressed with your life. There's nothing in your life that he wants. You follow me? There's nothing that you can give to him and, 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 it, and it will be as equal as to the cross of Christ. See, God's not a respecter of persons. He can't accept an advanced person. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. It's impossible to please God unless you are in his son. So it doesn't matter. All these things that people try to do, I remember watching these guys and they would, they would be crying, hysterical at the altar. And I remember going like, there was one time where I had this little emotional piece of me going, well, well maybe this is right. Maybe, I mean, all these guys, are, they're all crying and they're walking up. And, you know, well, really what they were doing is they were simply acknowledging that they were sinning right? Which is a good thing, but they were doing it with the false impression and the extortion that they were going to hell if they didn't stop the sin. Now, I can tell you that these people did not stop the sin. It went two weeks, they went back to school, and the same thing happened all over again. So I'm like, so when did you get saved? Was you saved this time? You saved that? And now can you realize how the ploy of Satan is to take something like sin, which is something that God does not like and he is against, and, and turn it into something that confuses the issue of salvation. Make the cross of Christ not the, the focus and the motivation and turn that focus and motivation back upon you. It's all on you now. It's all about you, right? So instead of looking at the completed work of, cross, of the Christ and the cross, keeping your focus on the cross, keeping the simplicity of the cross in mindset, keeping the concepts of justification crystal clear, all of a sudden you start thinking about yourself. Dude, you're a failure. <laughs> I mean, I'm a failure. We're all a failure when it comes to the sinful nature of us and how we give into it. And, and, and that's why we needed the cross. So when I look at it, I go, how are you guys so naive to believe that that's what you're going to do? If the demonstration of the righteousness of God is in the law, right? Paul says, Romans chapter number three, verses 20 and 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, right? So the righteousness of God is in, in the law. Well, the opposite of sin is the law. Therefore, you're simply telling the individual, keep the law. And what happens when you try to keep the law? You're a debtor to the whole law, Paul says. Every single bit of it. You can't, you know, curse this man that continueth not in all the book of the law to do them, right? Every single piece. And you read this next verse, and this publican standing afar off, he says, God, I promise this time I'll repent of my sin. See, people are not that dumb. Eventually you reach a point where you go, this ain't working. <laughs> I keep repenting, and I keep feeling like I'm unsaved. And if you're going to tie your salvation or your feeling of salvation to, to an event, that's a problem, right? Don't do that. Don't try to say, well, because this time I promised to God that I would never sin, now, now I know that, now, now I know that's the day that I've, I'm definitely saved. Well, look, you're saved because of what happened at the cross. And whether or not you could pick a date and time, that's great. Hopefully you can. If you can't, hopefully today you do understand the knowledge of the truth about the gospel, right? So I mean, I've asked people, when, when exactly were you saved? I don't really know. I mean, maybe it was this day. I mean, for me, I used to always say it was May 9th, 1989, in the back of my mom's Uick Regal. Well, do I really know that that was the date? Not really. I don't know. I mean, I kind of think it was, right? But then as I got older, I kind of, you know, who knows? Maybe when I was 13. I, I, I don't really know. I mean, I always kind of understood the gospel, but I can tell you that it really didn't become more applicable in my life till the time I was probably 23 years old, right? So it, it, it's probably seven, eight, seven, eight years ago, it actually came, became more applicable to me and I actually took it more seriously. And I, I think about it like, man, people are so naive in this. But again, I must not say that because it's not naive, right? It's, it's being fooled. It's being taken captive by the will of Satan. So when you read this next verse, the guy says this, the public is standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. Well, yeah, when you know how sinful you are, when my son gets in trouble, you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't look at me. That's how I know he's, he did something wrong. Yes, the two, two or three days ago, I walked into his room and I go, dude, why is your, uh, why is your nightlight and your noise machine off? And he goes, uh, uh, uh. and he kind of just looks at me and I go, what'd you do? And he goes, uh, and he can't, you know, I can tell he's trying to think of a lie. He's only four. And so I look down at the thing and I go, dude, you unplugged it. 
And this is how I talk to him. I talk to him just like this. You know, I'm not like, hey, buddy, you unplug? No, I'm like, dude, you unplugged it, didn't you? And he goes, uh, I'm like, why'd you unplug it? You can't unplug it. You're not allowed to touch anything that plugs into the wall. You know that, don't you? And he goes, and I said, come clean. Did you unplug it? And he's like, uh, and I'm like, come clean right now. Did you unplug it? And he looks at me and he goes, no, I, I didn't unplug it. And I'm like, you liar. And he goes, <laughs> and so then I gave him three spankings, you know, just little swats on the butt. And then I said, you need to go sit in timeout, sit in timeout for a minute. We came back over and I looked at him. I said, dude, did you unplug it? He said, I can't touch the bump. I'm not going to think You know, whatever. He's telling me this stuff. You know? And then he comes clean, right? But the whole time he's talking to me, he's not looking at me. He's doing this. He's like, he's like, like, why aren't you looking at me? You know, when, you know when you catch somebody in a lie like that? You're like, it, they always are dodging you on the eyesight thing. You're like, yeah, yeah, I, I did that. You're like, dude, why can't you look at me right now? Because their guilt is just coming through their eyes, right? And then you read this, and the publican standing afar off, far off, right? Not lift up so much as eyes out of the heaven. Doesn't even want to look near God. What's he do? Notice this. He smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a what? A sinner. See, what I, that to me is repentance. That's repentance. That's the best form of repentance. Why? Because it's an acknowledging of the way God sees your sin. See, you and God have to have the same mindset about sin. And when you don't connect on the mindset of how sin is, you and God are in disagreement, right? Right? And how can two walk together unless they what? Amos says two walk together unless they do what? Unless they agree. You ever done a three-legged race before? Yeah, it's pretty fun. Great way to break your ankle. But, you know, I used to think that was a blast. Me and my buddy Billy Brown, we used to do the three-legged race all the time at every summer camp, every Awana Olympics that we did. And we were so fast at that thing. But you know how we did it? We would do this count. We go one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, and we'd speed it up and we keep going. And you know, outside was one, inside was two, and we knocked that thing out. We would count it the whole way, and that was our trick. Other people would just be running, and they wouldn't be counting it. We'd be doing it like a army rhythm, you know, like we as we'd be running. And so, when you don't have that same unity with God about your sinfulness, that's a problem. See, when people say I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn from my sin, dude, what, what sin? Give me the list of all the sins you're going to turn from. Start writing them down, but they'll go, well, that's not the, that's not the point. Well, what do you mean that's not the point? What if you miss one? Don't you think that's important that you shouldn't miss any of your sins? Well, well that's not the issue. Because the issue is not about sin at all. It's about your self-righteousness. That's what it comes down to. So when you read this verse, notice what it says in verse number 14. Notice this phrase. To be justified of God is what all men want. They don't just don't, they just don't know it yet. They find other ways to justify themselves, but what they really want is they want God to justify them. If all men live in fear of death, right? All men do. They all live in fear of death. They're scared of dying. Every single one. So why then can we overcome that? Only ways through being justified by God, having peace with God. And he says, I tell you this man, which one? The guy who said, I'm not, I, I'm, I don't do the bad things. I'm not like the other guy. No, it's look what he says. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. I can tell you that by saying you're going to turn from your sin is actually telling God that you have some power in your flesh that you really don't have. Think about it. You're going to tell God, I can do something that you flat out told me I can't do, I'm going to do it. Especially to the unregenerate person. Absolutely to the unregenerate person. The unregenerate person has zero power in his flesh to turn from any sin. Now the regenerate person, the man, the, the man who has the new man, yeah, he's got some more power in him. But what's it require? Keep this in mind. I talk to people about this all the time. They're like, I got saved like when I was uh, seven. And man, I've still been sinning the whole time. I'm like, well, yeah. Um, how much Bible do you know? How much scripture do you know? How edified are you? How established and built up in the faith are you? Not very much? Well, that's the reason why you're sinning all the time. It's, it's a matter of the doctrine. If you don't have it working in you, it's not going to work. It's not going to happen. It's a conscious choice. I remember one time one of the pastors said, each time you're tempted to sin, or each time you, you, you do sin, he says, open up your Bible and read Romans 6, Romans 7, and Romans 8. I remember I did that for a while. You know what I didn't like? I was just like, 
sinning's not fun anymore. And I get really condemned when I curse. You know, it's it's funny, like, but it's true. You start to do it. You're more conscious of conscious of it, and your testimony beca- be, is is able to be built up a lot more. I'm not making promises to God, but see, God God doesn't want a man to not be zealous of good works. Paul says that we should be a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Paul says in, in Titus, he says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that doing what? Denying ungodliness or things that are not God like likeness qualities and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, right? So what am I getting at? Well, where does this stuff come from? Well, there's a verse, turn it with me in the book of Luke, and people I've heard I've heard this guy quote it before. His name is um, Paul Washer. Some of you guys have heard of him. Quotes it all the time. He, he'll get up there and he's got this whole thing where he cries and tells people that all the Christians are going to hell and that narrow is the gate which leadeth unto life and wide is the gate which leadeth to destruction and narrow is the gate and few there be that find it and, and the few that be that find it are those that really keep the law because those have to be you know the true saved, the ones who are the true believers, those who have truly, as he says, repented of their sins and all those type of things. Well, can I tell you that repentance is a thing that, that happens on a daily basis? You have to constantly remind yourself of your sinful nature and, 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 and you must constantly not fall into the lie of the devil that somehow you are righteous. Paul says, in, or not Paul, Christ says in Luke chapter 12, in uh, verse number 13, look what he says. There were, there were present at the season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices, right? So what happened is, look what he's doing. Guys are going, oh, hold on, the Galileans, look what they did. How, look how is that the same thing that just happened over there in, in Luke chapter number 18, right? Same stuff. What are they doing? They're trying to think that they're better than somebody else, okay? Now let's make a quick aside here and note that never once in the scripture does it state that just because all men sin, we shouldn't be concerned about sin, right? People say, well, you should just be concerned with the, 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 you know, the beam that's in your own eye. Well, yeah, yeah I should good and as i've said before when you know you know how to truly do spiritual judgment when you start pointing the fingers people are going to come right back at you and if you are living a life holy acceptable to god which is your reasonable service people ain't got nothing to hold against you and your word is a lot more power when you have a lot of stuff aka skeletons hanging out guess what happens people are going to be giving you a lot of reproof as well so you better suck it up and take it because it's going to come but it's good for both it's good for the person who's receiving the rebuke and the reproof, and it's good for the person who's, who's getting it back at them when they say, yeah, 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 but, 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 but you do this and you do that and you do that. Great. We're all sinners. Let's all work on that. So reading this passage, these guys were getting all, you know, basically they're trying to tattletale, okay? They're tattletaling saying, well, look, the Galileans, they, the, you know, they had, they had some blood that Pilate mingled with their sacrifices. How, how could we allow this? Notice this. And Jesus answering and said unto them, Suppose ye these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans? So he's trying to say, Do you think these guys are any worse than the other guys? You think they're worse than those guys? That you don't really understand sin. You still don't understand sin. Then he says this, They were sinners because of all the Galileans, because they suffered such things. I tell you nay. But notice this next phrase. Why does he just say, Nay, you guys are all sinners? Because... He can say it in a different way that makes, a lot, makes it a lot more powerful because it's saying, you need to have a, a mindset about this that I have. Nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise, what? Perish. Where else do you see that word perish? Probably in the most famous verse of all time. John three sixteen. For God so the world that gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have what? everlasting life. So what does it mean to perish? It means to die. Okay, well, if, if Christ said, notice this now, for if Christ said, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life, how then can we have another verse that says, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. How can we have that? How can that work? See, what people get confused about is they don't see that the nation of Israel has a very long history with God, the Father, right? Through the law. It's been there for for thousands of years. And they just just forget about that. So to the Christian in modern day, they walk into the book of Matthew and go, Well, look, we see John the Baptist and he's telling all the men to repent, so we must repent. 
and they just think they're going to go out there and follow each other message like whoa 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 why would you think immediately that that's applicable to you and, and quite frankly what john actually says in john chapter 17 i believe it's uh, uh i'm sorry john i'm sorry it's acts chapter number 18 it says john the baptist says that he was preaching the baptism of repentance that is, that they should believe on him who is to come after them. See, what you have to do first is, is you're not going to care who Jesus is unless you realize him being the judge of the world. Turn with me to Acts chapter 17. See, the reason why you repent and you get on the same page about your sin with God is because of this right here. This is the main reason why people should repent about their sin. They should think about their sin and go, whoa, whoa. See, they're not, they're not turning from their sin. They're acknowledging their sin before God and going, whoa, where's the remedy? Where's, where's the payment? How can I get this stuff taken care of? Not making a promise to God and saying, I promise I'll never do it ever again. And then you're going to lie and you're going to do it again. So you read in, in Acts chapter 17, in verse number 29, he says, For then as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold, silver, or stone, or graven by art and man's devices, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to what? To repent. He's telling everybody to repent. I'm going to take you to a couple more passages here, and I want you to see how this progression works. The, the reason why he tells every man to repent is in verse number 31. Look at this. Notice this. Notice this phrase. Why would you care about your sinful nature? If there's nothing that comes after death, why do I care about my sin? Who cares? Live it up. Do whatever you want to do. But as we know, and as we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2 last week, that the, 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 the Jews who forbade, right, Paul, to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, what does he say? He says, they fill up their sin always, and the wrath of God has come upon them to the uttermost. And that's exactly what takes place here with these men. Unless they repent, unless they get their salvation through Jesus Christ and are justified, they're not going to stop sinning. You understand that, correct? There's not, you're not going to make a promise to God to say, I'm not going I'm, I'm to sin anymore. He says, in the times of this ignorance, we can get into this for hours, but I'm trying to stay big picture. God winked at, and I can talk about all the reasons why God winked and how he winked and what he did and how that happens. He says, but now God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in what? In righteousness. So what's the opposite of sin? Righteousness. So what's he going to do when he judges the world in righteousness? He's going to look at your sin. And he's going to compare it to his righteousness, and he's going to go, there ain't no righteousness found. He says, by, in the world in righteousness, by that man who he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised, what? Raised him from the dead. Now notice this next phrase. And when, he, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. So part and part and departed from among them, howbeit certain men claved unto him and did what? And believed. See, when they believe, that's, the, that's, that's really a synonym for repent. Because that repentance is a change of mind about the issues of sin. It's you seeing sin how God sees it. It's you and God being in an agreement, full and 100% agreement about your sinfulness. That's what he wants you to do. Notice that phrase in Luke chapter number 18. Remember, we just read it. He wouldn't look up his eyes. What does he do? He says, God, be merciful to me, a what? A sinner. So what is that? Is that not quoting the Bible? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What did the, what did the Pharisee do? For some have sinned, but not nearly as little as I have. And I have not come that short of the glory of God. I'm up there. You see how that works? So it's a disguised attempt to get people to keep that law. Turn with me over to the book of, uh, of 2 Corinthians. I want to read you, read you a verse that is really cool because, for my opinion, there's all different types of the ways that the word repentance can be used. A lot of people say repentance is being sorrowful. Well, yes, I can, I, I can show you definitions of that, right? In the Old Testament, you see God numerous times stating that it repented God that he had made man. It repented God. God repented because he made man. Huh? How, how, how does that work if God has sin? You follow me? If God doesn't have sin. 
People go, well, that's a different word because that word is not the same word as the repentance that's used over there. Well, what do you mean? How is it not the same word? How, how, when did the word change? So clearly God has nothing to do with sin, right? He, his nature is not sinful. So the, that word repent in, in relation to it, God repented, what did he do? Can it sorrow him? Can God be saddened? Sure. Can God change his mind? Absolutely. We, we saw that with Nineveh and Jonah. In, in the book of Jonah, we read those verses in which it said, And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. Right? See, when you turn from your sin, what are you doing? You're keeping the law. And what is that? It's a work. It's what it is. It's a work. So you read this next verse in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. And uh, read like verse number 2. Receive us. We have wronged no man. This is 2 Corinthians 7 verse 2. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you. For I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. With, without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down, comforted us by those by the coming of Titus. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire. So Titus goes over to see the Corinthians. Titus gets there and he tells Paul about what he saw. He goes, look, when he, when he comforted in you, he told us your earnest desire. Notice this. Your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. See, before, they looked at Paul and they looked at the things that he said in 1 Corinthians and said, you know what? Screw off, Paul. We don't, we don't, don't tell us what to do, right? Go read 1 Corinthians. And, and, and this is the, that would be a prime example. If Paul was going to tell people to repent of their sins to, and get saved, that would be the time to do it, right? But even that guy in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, let that one, let Satan have his fun with that guy for the destruction of the flesh that the Spirit will be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. What do you mean? He goes, let that guy wreck his flesh with the sin that he's doing that, he's not, that he thinks is okay. Let him go out and do that. That's, that's, his, that's his decision to go and do. But notice what he says, that the Spirit will be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. See, Paul understood that your flesh can do all kinds of things. It doesn't mean that you're not saved. It's the edification. It's what you need. You have to take in the doctrine. And for these guys, when Titus comes in and he sees that, that Paul's doctrine, that is the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of God, was working in them, notice this, what happened. He says this, For though I made you sorry with a letter. Now, I want you to... This, this verse, we can, we're going we're gonna to pretty much close with this, but I want to just... Spend some time looking at this. He says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, right? So the things that he wrote in 1 Corinthians, did he bewail them, right? I mean, how many times he says, What will you? Shall I come back with the, with the, you know, with the sword? I love that because he's like, As a father admonishes his children, that's what he's doing. He's doing it for the right motives. He's doing it for the right reasons. My wife gives me some, you know, some junk every once in a while for how I discipline Noah. And I tell her, I'm like, Look, I'm doing the things my dad did to me. And I remember those things because I had a healthy fear of my father. It was a good fear. Like I knew that I could push my dad around a little bit, but when he meant business and things were done, I, I was scared of him. I was absolutely, it was a good healthy fear. I was like, dude, my dad ain't messing around. If he tells us to do that, we're doing it. And he's going to throw down. Like he's literally going to tackle us and pull us onto the ground if we don't mess around. Like, and, and, and there's times that we did, I mean, over my life, I can think of at least five times in which one time I was probably... I had to be 14 or 15. I was living in, the, in a condo on the beach with my parents. And I remember I was sitting there and my mom was saying something like, you never do this and blah. She was just raveling off, right? Me, typical 14, 15 year old punk was like, you know, mouthing off to her saying all kinds of stuff. And my mom's like, you're not listening to me. You're just turning your head and do, 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 do. And I remember that I looked at my mom and I went like, I made like a, like a jerking motion, like in her face, like kind of try to scare, right? Like, you know, you what? You want some of that? You know, kind of like nodding my head to her. My dad gets off the, 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 the little bar stool over there, jumps over the couch, tackles me on the floor, takes his, takes his forearm, sticks it into my throat, 
And he says, if you ever do that again, you are out of here. And then we're going like, ha, ha, ha. and I remember thinking like, oh shoot. Like, and I remember standing up and my dad's like, apologize. And I was like, sorry. I was so scared. And I was like, but my dad's not messing around. But you know, people today be like, oh my goodness, your dad's an abuser. No, that's what I needed. I mean, I was a punk. I probably would have pushed my mom or did something stupid. But he realized that and he, and, he, and he went to that extent. See, with Paul, he did the same thing. He pushed those guys really hard. He said some things that probably made them really mad. As you can see right there, for though I made you sorry with a letter. They didn't like the things that he wrote. And they felt bad about it. Paul says this, for though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. What do you mean, do not repent? How, what is he repenting of? You see, this, this word has a lot of definitions, but it all comes back to this issue of... In this particular situation, it has to do with his mind. He's like, I'm not changing my mind about what I wrote. I'm sticking with that. What I wrote to you, I meant it, and I put it in there for a reason. I do not repent of that. I'm not changing my mind about that stuff. And he says, goes on to say, though I did repent. So what do you mean? How does that work? I, I do not repent, though I did repent? How can you do one and the other? Well, the only way to do one and the other is if it has what? He says, though I did repent. So there was a time in Paul's, Paul, while he wrote that, he's like, not only did he have some sorrow, I'm sure, writing that letter, he wasn't happy about doing it. He probably second-guessed himself and said, oh my goodness, should I, should I have been that forceful? What should I have written? You know, whatever it might have been. But he realizes, no, no, that was for the right reasons. Paul says, for I perceive that the same epistle that hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. See, what they learn and what they grew from this is they realize that, wow, you know, all that sin that Paul called us out on, it really was harming the body. It really was causing a problem. Now Paul says, look, now I rejoice. Not that you were made sorry, because being sorry doesn't matter. I'm sorry. Great. Cool. Everybody's sorry when they get caught. Name me a person that's not sorry when they get caught. Okay. Some weird, you know, Timothy McVeigh or you know, Dahmer or some weirdo that's like, I'm not sorry. I didn't do anything wrong. Okay. Yeah. Serve some crazy guy. Okay. The reason I say that is because every time I say something, it's the lawyer aspect in me. Cause I say something and I go, well, I can think of an al alternate argument. I always can. You can give me an argument and I can come up with 13 alternate arguments that you're, I'm already thinking about. Right. That's why I like how Paul writes because he anticipates that. But he says, now I rejoice. Not that you were made sorry. The sorry is not working. He's like, but that you sorrowed to what? That you sorrowed to repentance. That you sorrowed to a change of mind about that. You went, you know what? Yeah, he is right. And, and now I'm going to think differently about this stuff. Because what happens when you start to think differently? What does that actually start to Im impact? It does start to impact your actions. Because what do you have to do first before you do an action? Where does it get triggered? It gets triggered in your brain. And then what happens? Then it comes out through your body. So when Paul says, but that you sorrowed to what? Now rejoice, not that you're made sorry, but that you sorrow to repentance, for you were made sorry after a, and notice this word, after a godly manner. See, the world, I'm going to talk about it in a second, the world doesn't have the ability to sorrow after a godly manner. They have nothing but to feel sorry for themselves and go, that's not that bad, it's okay. They have no true satisfaction and forgiveness for that. Paul says, but ye sorrowed for repentance, for you made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. They weren't harmed. None of that stuff hurt them. It was all for their good. It was all for edification. Now notice what he writes here. He says, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to what? To salvation. Now this isn't salvation to eternal life. This is salvation from that sin. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Meaning, once they realize the sinful aspects of what they had done, they go, wow, yeah, you know what? That was hurting us. And we need, we need to change our mind about how, that, how this sin is going to function in our lives. And we do need to stop it too. But notice what he says, not to be repented of. Meaning, you're not supposed to change your mind back to the way it used to be. You're not supposed to go back and change your mind again. See, how could you repent and then repent of it again? It's all about changing your mind. You see how he says, not to be repented of. Well, how could you turn from the turn, right? You're not doing that, not to be repented of. But the sorrow, notice this, but the sorrow of the world worketh what? Worketh death. They can be sorry to the blue in the face, but you know what they don't have? They have no salvation from their sin. It doesn't matter. They can't go to the cross of Christ. They don't have it. They don't know what that is, right? 
The world's not looking. The justified member of the body of Christ can always sorrow to salvation in Jesus Christ. Always. Right? Now, what does Paul say? I could talk about this verse for hours or 40 minutes in. Let's just finish with this, and we'll pick up next week on the rest of this. This is going to be several weeks of study. Paul says in verse number uh, 11, notice this. For behold, the selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort, and afterwards, what carefulness it wrought in you. What do you mean, you careful? We're going to think about our actions before we do them. We're going to think about the consequences that happens. Carefulness comes when you truly understand consequences. You know why when you're, when you're young, you make dumb mistakes and they ruin your life? Because you don't think of the consequences. And then they always say, when you hit 30 years old, you reach maximum maturity. 30 years old is that mark. You reach maximum maturity in which you truly understand consequences. And I would say that's absolutely true. I'm way more careful than the 21-year-old that we were fishing with the other day who's going, let's just stay a little longer. And Todd and I are like, eh, you know, we need to get out of here. That storm's looking pretty bad. No, that won't be good. We'll just put on our rain jackets. I'm like, dude, that thing is pumping like 35, 40 miles an hour. We need to get out of here because we're thinking of the consequences. If we get stuck, what's going to happen? What if our bilge pump stops working? What if this, th- you know, all the things that happen, they, he, they don't think, the 21-year-old doesn't get it, Right? So he says here, what carefulness it wrought in you is because now you're thinking about what impact this sin has, right? Remember in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he gets so, he, he tells the guys, he goes, dude, don't you see that you shouldn't be going, good job, you slept with your dad's, dad's wife, you know? That's not a good thing. Like, how do you think that's good? What planet are you on? You're on the planet of the devil. And that's why you think that's a good and acceptable thing. He says that what carefulness had wrought in you. Now notice this next word, what clearing of yourselves. See, the clearing is, dude, dude that's not me. Don't, don't try to put that stuff toward me. That's not what I do, right? I'm not about that anymore. I've changed my mind about those actions. We don't think that's acceptable behavior. And he says, what indignation. So what is indignation? That stuff that we did before was bad. That We don't want anything to do with that. It's a righteous hatred for the sin. And going on, he says, yea, what fear. Why? Because it was a serious nature. It was not something that was just, oh, who cares? Yea, what vehement desire. What's the new vehement desire? It's this last part. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things, you've approved yourself to be clear in this matter. So the, the matter, I, I, think, I think the matter... In, in my opinion, what is the matter that he's talking about? It's just the whole writing of Paul. It's, 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 it's not looking at Paul's writing in, in, the, in the epistle that he wrote and, and, and believing it to be the word of God, but just believing whatever. It's just Paul's writing. Who cares, right? We can do what we want to do. So they get into this whole thing, and they have approved themselves to be clear in this matter. He says, Therefore I wrote unto you, I did it not for this cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. In other words, what? Love for the body, right? He goes, therefore, we have, we're comforted in your comfort. Yea, and exceedingly, the more joyed we joy, we for the joy of Titus, because the spirit was refreshed by you all. Because Titus thinks he's going to get to, to Corinthians, or Corinth, and go, what are these Corinthians doing? You know, he's heard about what's happening. He's, he knows. And he goes, wow, what's going to happen? This could be an absolute circus when I get there. But No. He says, for I've boasted anything to him of you, I'm not ashamed. But as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, has found a truth. And his inward affection is more abundant toward you, whilst he remembered the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. You're able to do the things that I've given you to do because you have Christ in you, and it is the same one that works in you. It is him that works in me to, to will and to do of his, his good pleasure. We'll pick up next week. We'll hammer out some more of these verses on repentance, and we got a lot to talk about on this issue of repentance. It's, not, it's going to be a couple more weeks. So, all right, let's close in word of prayer.